Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, welcome to the first edition of this special program. Uh, the program is called uh, Talk to Me. Uh, and I'm your presenter, uh, Sarah Kamara, on uh, GMB ETV. All right, um, on today's program, we will be uh, talking to somebody um, who is very significant, somebody who is very important um, in this country, uh, no other person uh, other than uh, Dr. Mama Sawane. Uh, doctor, you welcome to the program. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Uh, Dr. Sawane, uh, you are a household name um, in this country. Uh, but can you just share with us as to uh, what inspired you, you know, uh, to pursue a career in agriculture and climate change economics? Thank you very much, Sarah, and I'm very grateful to be part of this show. As you rightly say, my name is Mama, and uh, I work with the University of the Gambia. Yeah. And, uh, well, agriculture, if you look at it, uh, I am born and raised in a farming community. You are a farmer then? I'm a farmer. <laughs> That's beautiful. Some will argue whether yeah. I'm a farmer or an agriculturist, actually. <laughs> okay. But uh, the, to cut the story short, yeah. uh, I was doing farming since my childhood ages. And during my school career, yeah. during the holidays, I have to take a leave and get to the provinces to help my father at the farm. Yeah. So since then, I developed a passion. So when I completed uh, my high school, then I wanted actually to read the medicine. Yeah. Uh, but along the way, uh, I said, well, why don't you take a career on agriculture? Then Gambia College was uh, there, and I had to apply for a higher diploma in agriculture, and I didn't regret it. Is it because of, you know, you come from a farming family, that's why you decided to change from medicine, you know, to um, agriculture? Or... Actually, medicine was my first uh, priority mm -hmm. and uh, followed by agricultural economics. Okay. Uh, during the high school, I was a science student and uh, at Gambia High School then mm -hmm. uh, in the second sciences and I was doing economics alongside and I was inspired by one of... Uh, our agri science teacher, that okay. is uh, Mr. Biko Osu. Okay. You must have heard his name, yeah. and he slept just a few weeks ago. And uh, he inspired me a lot because during that time, I read a lot of uh, books uh, that he wrote, uh, agricultural manuals. Then I was inspired to read uh, agricultural economics. but. At that time, yeah. I didn't know actually what career do I want to do precisely. Yeah. So when I came to the Gambia College and I found that, uh, well, I can do something agriculture. It was a general agriculture, but okay. along the way, we were doing some economics, but it was not uh, intense economics. Okay. So, but I developed a passion for it. And though it was tiring at some point in time, because... Yeah going to the field and you understand that yes, there exactly. is a lot of drudgery yes exactly. and yeah. we don't have the technology to be a kind of an agriculturist that you see in the in the developed world okay but nonetheless uh, for me i'm a type of person whatever i intend to do i do it with, do passion, it with passion and okay. with determination and that keep me moving forward okay uh, let's just go back a little bit mm -hmm. let's say for example um, during your early school days, you yes. know, your primary school, junior and senior secondary school, um, how was it uh, compared to nowadays? Well, at my primary yeah. school, I can say agriculture was not that much reinforced at that time, but yeah. I can fully recall during my time in grade three up to grade five, we used to have some school gardens and at least we will have some school dates that we take care of. But at a high school or okay. at the secondary school, that was way back in Brikamaba, okay. around 1995 towards 1999, we used to have one agricultural science teacher. Possibly he might be listening to me. That yeah. is Mr. Sin. Uh, he now he now works at the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education. Yeah. He inspired us all because at that time each student 
will be entitled to a plant and also a garden. So you have wow. to take care of a plant, either okay. one or two, at Brikamba. Okay. If you go to Brikamba today, yeah. most of the trees you will be seeing, we are the pioneers of that, oh, uh, okay. those trees. We started nurturing those trees at that time. Mm. So at that time, uh, we started uh, practicing agriculture at the uh, secondary school more okay. than uh, even at the high school. Okay. Uh, so since you come from a farming family, then mm. uh, it means that you've been going to school at the same time, you know, uh, going to the farm. Yes. What happens normally <laughs> at my primary school, that's yeah. uh, what happens. Uh, my father used to be a very big farmer in the yeah. sense that uh, uh, all his life is at the farm. So yeah. normally when we go to school at that time, we normally close around two o'clock. So okay. when you come from home, sometimes you don't find your lunch at home. No. Sometimes they will take your lunch you find at, your the, at, the farm. at the farm. So you sometimes you are compelled yeah. <laughs> to be at the farm. So my peers at times okay. will be, when we have, you know, in those days we used to have now eaten yeah. football matches during the summer. So when you... you come from school, then you'll be forced to go and take your lunch at the farm. So it becomes part of you. Wow. And if it is during the holidays, then that is it. Early morning, when you wake up, you have to be at the farm. Sometimes you don't come back till uh, late at night or after matric. Wow. So it was part of us. And <laughs> alongside, we used to have small ruminants alongside. Okay. So sometimes I used to tend a sheep at the, at the backyard. So it was just <laughs> like <No>. that for us. <laughs> yeah, that was marvelous. <laughs> now, um, looking at your educational experience, yes. um, you've gone through a lot of um, schools and passed through um, several countries. Uh, yes. One of them, you know, you were at the Seha Antajub University, Correct. you know, in, in Dakar. You were also in Putra in Malaysia yeah. and also UTG. Um, how does that shape your perspective, you know, uh, of agricultural economics? Okay, yeah. I will start with uh, University of the Gambia. That's yeah. where I did my undergraduates. And when I was doing the undergraduates, actually I was enrolled to do general agriculture. Yes, in general agriculture, but alongside, as I told you, yeah. um, at my secondary school, I had a passion to read either medicine or agriculture. agriculture. Yeah. So as the destiny dictates sometime, yeah. When I found myself at the university, then I was doing general agriculture. I had to take some courses alongside with economics yeah. because I want to be an agricultural economics that will also obviously help this country in terms of either production planning or policy development in related to agriculture. Yeah. Because we understand agriculture is the, we always say it's the backbone of the country. Yes, yes. but it's the most underdeveloped. Yes, yes. yes. It's, it's the most underdeveloped. I will, exactly. I, I yeah. will agree with you, yeah. but it's, we must agree it's the oxygen of the country. <laughs> okay. So, so alongside. So yeah. I started developing the passion for agriculture too at uh, Gambia level, and okay. uh, I know we have only few agri-economics in this country. Mm. So after my graduation, I was uh, absorbed by the university as a graduate assistant. Okay. And uh, I served as a graduate assistant barely eight months to nine months. Then I got a scholarship. That okay. is an IDB scholarship, Islamic Development Bank, to go to Malaysia. So when I get to Malaysia, that's the time I found myself in a very suitable place. Yeah. First mm -hmm. of all, yeah. my background, I'm a Muslim. Yeah. And uh, it's a country that you uh, you are free to practice your religion. You don't have any kind of hindrance. Okay. But alongside is the university that's uh, it's an agricultural university, oh, okay. University okay. Putra Malaysia. Yeah. Though it has other faculties in economics and so on and so forth. Yeah. But as an agricultural economics in that university, my main faculty, yeah. all my courses were in the economics okay. uh, department of faculty. Yeah. So I was opportune to interact with uh, a quite a number of scholars there, yeah. uh, top lecturers, top professors, yeah. and that also helped to motivate me further. Yeah. Because I wanted to come to this country uh, with a difference yeah. to help. First of all, university, we have uh, very few agroeconomics there. And we have a young university that we need to, I mean, 
build the capacities. Uh, we were studying only general agriculture. If you want to do agroeconomics, you have to take some courses in agricultural faculty and some courses okay. at the economics to combine, to blend them together. Yeah. So that is uh, my pathway. And I found it very interesting in Malaysia. I was able to also attend some conferences okay. outside of Malaysia, which of course helped me to understand the area better. And my professor yeah. uh, liked me at that time uh, uh, when I was in Malaysia. He, used to take some PhD classes, okay. though I was doing my master's program. So he, at the end, recruited me as a, a research assistant. Sometimes I will be with him in his PhD class to help some of the students in the data analysis. Those are PhD students at that time. Yeah. And uh, so that's how... Yeah, I, but but looking, at, looking at Malaysia and mm -hmm. then looking at the Gambia, mm -hmm. you know, um, Agriculture in Malaysia, mm -hmm. agriculture in Gambia is is quite different. Different. You're talking about the advanced world. Mm -hmm. uh, were you not let down? Mm -hmm. You know, when you went to Malaysia, you know um, that you know um, the expectation that that you were expecting, you know, is far different. There's a huge gap between Malaysia and. Yeah, and the Gambia. I was in Malaysia yeah. way back in 2010, 11, 2011 precisely, mm -hmm. and one motivating me in Malaysia yeah. when I read the history of Malaysia yeah. I was told Malaysia around 1970s towards 1975 or 1978 they were just like uh, a country like Nigeria or Nigeria was far better than Malaysia okay. if since most of the palm oil Malaysia Malaysia today is almost either the second or the third yeah. largest producer of oil, yeah. oil palm and they got those oil palm from uh, Nigeria and and they were able to grow their agriculture to, to where it is right now. Yeah. And we were also told in Malaysian history mm -hmm. that around that time, 1978, at some point in time, they were unable to even pay their salaries. At no. some point in time, Nigeria has to bail them out. Intervene, okay. Intervene. So it's not a, a, a developed uh, a country, per se, yeah. but through determination, they were able to create or find their pathway to, okay. to the development. Yeah. Uh, but it has to, it's boiled down to leadership and also people with passion and determination. And that's one of the things I learned. Uh, from Malaysian culture, you know, okay. when they want to do this and they make sure that they do it with passion and they are there. So I have seen how their agriculture was transformed with time. Yeah. From 1978 to the time I was there, mm -hmm. 1970, you just talk about barely three decades or less than that. Yeah. So if they are able to do that, I I, am, I was optimistic that we can do, that it. We can do it. That yeah. is one thing that kept me motivating. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but you were optimistic that we can do it. Yes. All right, that's a few years back. Yes. Are we still doing it? Are we doing it? Well, I would not say <laughs> we are not doing it. Actually, the progress is slow. It's very, very we could slow. Have, we could have done yeah. better. Okay. No, actually, we could have done better. Yeah. Uh, it's sometimes it's unfortunate. Uh, sometimes people don't want to take responsibility. I have to say that. And... Uh, Sometimes you put people in position. I think this is generally an, an African mentality sometimes. It's yeah. not uh, peculiar to all the Gambia. Uh, it's our problem. What belongs to public mm -hmm. uh, belongs to no one. That's, we have that culture. Mm -hmm. And you can see the kind of attitude people have towards work. For it's sure. not that we don't have talents. We have talents the in talents this country. Are already there in abundance, most yeah. of the people that are hon handling most of the key positions in this country are all educated outside. Yeah. And they have seen how those countries develop. We've seen the blueprints of other countries, you know. But we don't expect people from outside to come and develop our own country. If you look at countries like Malaysia, which I will give always example, yeah. uh, they don't have experts to come and develop Malaysia for them. They themselves had the passion and they need to move from where they were. So they took the lead. So we could have done the same thing. Okay. So it's just a matter of mindset, if I will call it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we need to 
there are a lot of insincerities there if you look at people in terms of attitude to work. For instance, you are taxed to do a work yeah. and you go, go to work, you're supposed to report at work at 8.30 and you come and you start work at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock. And you're supposed to close around 4 o'clock to yeah. complete certain tax and you close, you close around earlier. earlier. Yeah. So you see, yeah. you calculate and people okay. don't evaluate what you've done for a day. And if you want to move with that mentality, it becomes very difficult. Okay. But uh, uh, we can do it, and I believe, and I'm optimistic we can do it. Uh, it's just a matter of, I mean, I mean we ignite our own self, our passion okay. towards uh, development. Okay, and what happened at the uh, Seh Antejob University in Dakar? Well, uh, those are our neighbors, you know. Yeah, at Seh Antejob, uh, See, I, I studied agricultural economics, which of course, along the way, yeah. at my PhD level, uh, I wanted to continue doing agricultural economics, okay. to do a philosophy in that area. But uh, what I found, I found myself in the climate change economics, and mm -hmm. it is a very interesting field. If you look at it, some will ask why uh, not economics but climate economics. We find out these are all related. Uh, it's just the economics of climate change that I've specialized okay. at, uh, at Say Anta Job. Yeah. And Say Anta Job program was a specialized program. Okay. A specialized program in the sense that it was a regional program mm -hmm. uh, looking at the climate change in Africa. We already know climate change is a global threat okay. and it is affecting all sectors of life, but most importantly, it's affecting Africa. Okay. So way back around 2010 towards 2012, uh, this uh, regional concept was developed to train young scientists in Africa to look into climate affairs. And you have different areas. If you have climate change, water resources, climate change and agriculture, climate change and economic, climate change and education. But for Sayanta job, it was climate change and economics, which I was involved, obviously, at the third batch okay. of the program. And we found it very interesting. And uh, Sayanta job is a Francophone country, we understand. And the medium of instruction was French. Uh, was French. But as I said, our program was a specialized program. So the medium of instruction was in English because oh, okay. uh, we have uh, countries from 12, 12 country representations okay. and Gambia was the one representing Gambia for my batch and we found it very interesting. And at Se Antajob, I had uh, uh, interaction with uh, quite a number of professors and most of the professors are not actually Francophone Professors. They are Anglophone. They are Anglophone. Okay. We have some professors coming from the US, from UK, and, and even the neighboring country in Nigeria and uh, others from Togo. But one of the most interesting part of my journey in mm -hmm. Se Antajo was uh, my scientific visit in the United States at yeah. uh, Penn State University. Yeah. Uh, where I was opportune to go for at least three to four months uh, scientific fellowship at uh, United States, where I also uh, it also helped to enhance my data analysis capacity because I was able to be at the center where they have facilities and I was able to interact with professors there. Okay. So I was keen that uh, say Anta job. Uh, which is a Francophone uh, country and a Francophone university helped me to set. Though my French was not that good, yeah. uh, but uh, as as I am, I can understand most of things in French. Yeah. And if you talk to me in French, I can, even if I can okay. understand, <laughs> but I can understand things. Okay. But my interaction was great. All right. Uh, but um, how many projects are you currently uh, working on? In the Gambia? Yeah, in the Gambia. Well, uh, right now, quite a number of projects, to be honest with you. Uh, currently, I didn't tell you much about myself at the beginning, and um, not only an instructor at the university, yeah. um, also a scientific coordinator of a doctoral research, research program, program. Okay. at the university. That yeah. is the, one of the WASCAL uh, flagship programs that yeah. is on 
climate change and education okay. where we recruit students from almost 12 to 13 countries in West Africa okay. to pursue a PhD in climate change and education. Okay. So I'm the scientific coordinator. I coordinate the ac academic programs in terms of lecture scheduling and also supervision allocation to the student okay. and also monitor the progress of the PhD students and may have an interface, being an interface between them and their supervisor. Are there any outcome on that project? Yes, uh, there are quite an outcome yeah. because uh, it used to be a master's program okay. uh, from 2012, 2014 up to 2018 and the program transit to a PhD program. Okay. The PhD program started around 2019 and we were able to produce our first set of PhD students, yeah. almost eight PhD students in the last convocation. The program was able to, I mean, deliver eight PhD students and among the eight PhD students, uh, two of them are Gambians. Oh, okay. uh, Gambian, we have Gambian own grown pages in the climate change and education. And one of them is currently I mean, lecturing at the University of the Gambia. Okay. The other one is lecturing at Gambia College. So that is impactful. impactful yeah. And the other uh, six uh, from one is from Ghana, one is from Togo, one is from Mali, and the uh, other one is from Niger, and one from Senegal. Okay. So that was one of the programs. So we have a second batch, which of course is about 11 students. And all those 11 students were able to do their project defense in the various fields. And currently, they are all in their countries doing the data collection. And they have almost completed their data collection. They are all outside as well. They are all outside. And out of those 11 students, uh, two of them are Gambians too, okay. and uh, currently about five or six of them are on their scientific visit in Germany mm -hmm. to, to complete their PhD work. So by next year, uh, hopefully by March towards April, we will be graduating second cohort of the PhD students from that program. Mm -hmm. That's great. So that is one of the projects mm -hmm. I'm involved in, WASCAL. We okay. call it WASCAL. It's a, it's a household name in the Gambia. The country, exactly. So the other project that I'm engaged in at the moment at the university is what we call a reclam. It's a okay. reclam. It's a project that look into the nexus between renewable energy, climate change, and land management. Uh, this is a 24-year project uh, funded by the BMBF. Okay. In this project, we are looking at the relationship, if you like, between land use, renewable energy, and that of climate change. In other words, how can we, I mean, utilize our land in a way that we maximize the potential of a renewable energy, precisely solar PV, and uh, as a result of changing climate. And this project started well. Uh, what we are doing at the moment, we have some case study sites in the country, okay. about four case study sites, and it's a research base, of course. Okay. Where are those sites? Can you? Yeah, we are coming. Uh, the case study sites, one, we are looking at the coastal communities. In the coastal communities, how can we utilize the potential of renewable energy without uh, having an impact on land use? And those coastal areas, we visited places like Sanyang, places like Gunjur, Brufut, and that of Tanje. And uh, we did our preliminary assessment and to look at the visibility of having a pilot project in each of the sites. So it's not concluded yet. That is one of the case study side. That is the coastal community. Okay. We also doing a case study, or we did a preliminary case study on the on the urban sites, the urban agriculture. We understand that most women are involved in agricultural practices, especially garden. Garden. So yeah. we look at about four gardens in the Gambia that are in the urban. That is Bakao, Banjinindi here. We have Sukuta and Lame, and we look at the visibility of having another pilot project where we can use renewable energy to support livelihood, mainly women. And that is not also conclusive, so we will try to write a case study synthesis from that study to look at the, what is going to be the potential side to have 
uh, a pilot project for renewable energy to support livelihood. So that's the second case study. The third case study is to have a kind of a project around the uh, mangrove, oyster mangrove oh, site. Yes. We understand that quite a number of women are involved in oyster harvesting, that yes. is towards mangroves. But we also understand the significance of mangrove in environmental sustainability. Yes. And we trying to look at it, those communities that have their livelihood around the mangrove and they are doing oyster harvesting, how can we utilize the potential of renewable energy where we can improve livelihood, but we can also create a mechanism that we cannot, uh, we will not uh, deteriorate the mangroves that are around us. So we've selected some sites. That is one at uh, Kamalo, you know Kamalo? Kamalo, yeah. Yeah, we also have a uh, block. Okay. You know, block, we yep. they have mangroves, oyster fest inside. We have Jinak as Jinak, well okay. as uh, North Bank and that of uh, Kemoto. So mm -hmm. that report is also coming out uh, mm -hmm. to look at the potential of a site that can have a potential uh, renewable energy project that can support livelihood. That's the third case study. Mm -hmm. The fourth case study is the rural agriculture. We understand quite a number of rural communities are also engaged in farming or agricultural like horticultural production. Yeah. So we selected across the country four sites. One is Songkunda, you know, Songkunda is Songkunda. all the way in URR. We have uh, Birkaman, uh, das Birkamandi in CRR. We have uh, Nyani Sukuta in that also CRR. And we have Daslami in North Bank. Okay. So we're looking at the potential of having another renewable energy project that can support livelihood in those areas. Right. So, so, so it means um, all your projects are decentralized projects? They are decentralized yeah. across the country. So we're looking at the potential of having uh, a project that, uh, that is a renewable energy base and that can support livelihood, can change uh, livelihood of people in those communities. Okay. Uh, yeah. in, in short, you've been involved in a lot of activities, yes. you know, uh, when it comes to the UTG. Yes. Uh, what is your primary role? Your well, primary role at the UTG. Okay. My primary yes. role at the university, I'm an instructor. I'm yes. I currently uh, hold the status of a senior lecturer, okay. uh, where I take, uh, I teach... Uh, uh, environment and uh, agricultural economics discipline, mm -hmm. but mainly I focus on courses like uh, agricultural economics, environmental seminar, environmental policy, and that of uh, biometrics. Uh, biometrics is just a course that okay. normally you help students to do data analysis. I I love working with data and data, okay. data analysis. Yeah. So these are some of. So that's my primary role. But yeah. in addition to that. I'm also a scientific coordinator managing this uh, program, coordinating okay. the climate change program, doctoral research program. Right. So those are my key yeah. functions. But how do you balance it? You, how do you balance your administrative duties hmm. together with your research commitment? Well, uh, yeah. uh, what we do, because if you look at the role of an instructor at the university, yeah. it's basically three. Uh, we know universities function of course, it's three mandates. One is teaching, one is research, yep. and one is community uh, engagement, community uh, service, if you like it. Yep. So most often when people hear university professors, university instructors, uh, they only, I mean, uh, look at it from the teaching aspect. Yep. So how I balance it, I, I have a kind of a reduced load uh, for teaching. So okay. as a senior lecturer, you are entitled to take up to three courses, but at the moment I take uh, normally two courses uh, because I'm coordinating a doctoral research program that needs time, and the other time I allocate it for uh, research like some of this project. Most of the projects are research-based projects, so therefore you must create a time. So normally in the university lecturing, if I'm taking two courses, that means I'm engaged two days in teaching. Okay. The other days, five or three days, of course, I, I balance it within my research work and also some student supervision. I supervise both PhD students, master's okay. students, and also undergraduate students. So which of them is more rewarding to you? Uh, 
which of the which of one uh, which of the, where is, is it the administrative or the research which one is more rewarding well they yeah. are all my key uh, functions yeah i know they are your key functions yes but, but but one of them is more rewarding than the other well i, I rewarding in the sense uh I don't beneficial well, for me, they yeah. are, because teaching, obviously, you are impacting knowledge. Yeah. This is uh, is critical for me. And as a as a researcher, when you are doing teaching, you are also on top of issues. So okay. <laughs> if I'm a researcher, I'm not doing teaching, obviously, certain things might escape. I might, but when you are in the field, for instance, yeah. I love teaching biometrics. Okay. And in that biometrics, there are analysis. Sometimes I might be doing research. There are certain analysis I will not be doing it as a researcher. But when I'm doing it with students, yeah. you find out that it is always refreshing. Okay. But uh, for me, research is more rewarding for me if you look at it. And in addition to that, I can also do a lot of consultancies yeah, with some firms, even university based. Okay. But I don't only do lecturing and research. I also develop a lot of proposals for the university. Okay. These are award-winning proposals that are to bring projects to the university. Uh, together with my colleagues, uh, sometimes we can stay at the office late just to ensure that we complete a task. Okay. Yes. Uh, can, you, can you just share um, with the viewers, um, yeah. let's say, uh, one successful um, student project or research Mm -hmm. you know, uh, that you have done that is very, you know, impactful, mm -hmm. you know, on the student? Well, uh, quite a number of them, yeah. because uh, one of them is uh, the two PhD students I told you about yeah. WASCAL program yeah. uh, that have just completed and graduated, and now most two of their papers are in press, and mm. uh, I'm happy to report that I'm co-supervisor of both of them, <laughs> the two Gambians, but yeah. they have all graduated. Yeah. There are 11 students that were enrolled, and only eight graduate for now. And mm. out of the eight that graduate, two of them are Gambians, and that one, I, I was a co-supervisor to the students. Yeah. So we work towards uh, getting the mission. Okay. And they were also able to produce a policy brief okay. uh, from their research work, though the policy brief, we are yet to move it uh, to the next stage because we have to take, uh, involve other ministries like MECNA, that's okay. the Ministry of Environment, Climate yeah. Change and Natural Resources, yeah. because one work on uh, migration, you know, migration, how it is, it is a... It's a very hot cake, in, yeah. if you like, and there should be some policy actions. Exactly. So the student is working on it to take the policy uh, uh, brief to the next level, this, yeah. which is going to be very impactful for us to look at the migration, but migration that is climate induced. That's what he worked on. The other student, the PhD student, he worked on the, the vulnerability of coastal communities. We are aware, or we are aware of to the fact that um, climate change in terms of sea level rise is threatening uh, most of coastal communities. So she worked on vulnerability of coastal communities. Okay. Uh, so she is also developing a policy brief that yeah. we move to the next level. And the paper is already uh, accepted, will be out very shortly. Okay. that she was able to so that was impactful if i make that, that, that was very impactful yeah. exactly yeah. so um as the lead you just mentioned mecna mm -hmm. um as the lead uh, coordinator project coordinator on mm -hmm. monitoring reporting and, and verification of the solar project yes. um what has been your major achievement in this project so far okay uh yeah it's good that i didn't talk about yeah. some of my responsibilities <laughs> yeah i'm also responsible <laughs> for coordinating a mrv project uh, wow. for Magna. Yeah. In that project, uh, it's a very interesting project because in that project we are looking at the rapid rollout of solar PVs in this country. Okay. And if you understand very well, in t if you look at the, the NDC of the Gambia, that is the national determined contribution of this country, yeah. uh, you find out that there are mitigation measures, almost about 22 mitigation measures. And out of the mitigation measures, about eight of the measures are all related to energy. Okay. And if you look at those eight related me uh, mitigation measures, about three or four of them are all solar-based. So, and we have a proliferation of solar installations in this country. 
and uh, we know what solar can do in terms of uh, CO2 reduction, but we are unable to track the and monitor the growth of solar PVs in this country. Why? So yes, because there is no system. Okay. So one of the objective of this pilot project is to have or to create a legacy system that will enable us to do tracking and monitoring of the growth of solar PVs in this country. Okay. And the other thing is okay. to also build the capacities of various sectors on how solar can be used or can be calculated. We use calculations like marginal abatement cost calculation to be able to know or quantify the amount of CO2 that we are saving as a result of solar installation in this country. This can help us in our domestic decision, but most importantly, it can help us to report to our international donors, like this the amount of the, uh, emission level that we are doing as a country, and this can help us to get more funding. Mm -hmm. But most importantly, uh, we rely mostly on external uh, experts to do certain works for us in this country. For instance, if you do uh, even simple GIS or remote sensing work, generation of maps, we have to rely on external experts. So this project uh, also is trying to look to train various sectors, capacities, build capacities of our sector experts okay. so that will rely on national expert than that of the external expert. So it has four uh, principal objectives to have a legacy system, to train the capacities, to be able to track, but most importantly, to strengthen the monitoring, reporting and verification of mitigation actions in this country. Right. So we've successfully yes. have a working group, which you call a technical working group. But the biggest success, as I speak to you today on my desk, is we are able to produce a national perspective report wow. on the mitigation actions in this country. Okay. This perspective report look at the holistically what is the status of the MRV system in the Gambia, what are the gaps, what are the challenges, and the report came with a solid recommendation that the ministry has to take on board. Okay. in the next I mean, 12 months mm -hmm. in terms of cabinet paper so that we strengthen the MRV system in this country, but most importantly to have a permanent legacy system. But, but would, would they be implemented? That, you know, that, that is the problem in the Gambia, implementation process, and then not only implementation, but also uh, sustainability. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we always factor in sustainability uh, case in this uh, because the project we almost understand the project cycle projects are short-lived in other words they are time bound so what we are trying to work on in this project is to work on communication and institutional arrangement okay. and as part of sustainability mechanism of this pilot project we try to work to have what we call a climate action center uh, that is hosted at the University of the Gambia. All these initiatives are supported by Canadian government of Ministry of Environment and Climate Change. And that Climate Action Center is to support the pilot project, but most importantly, okay. to be able to sustain the capacity building initiatives that are ongoing on. But most importantly, to have a kind of a database system, uh, a registry yeah. that can be housed or hosted at the uh, MECNA, so be able to do the tracking. Obviously, yeah. we need the political will, we need the, uh, the commitment of everybody to be able to ensure that the system is sustained. We are sure that before March 2026, this system is going to be is going to be put in place by God willing, and we will ensure that all stakeholders are involved. That's why we are training the capacity. You just mentioned the political will. Yes. Yeah. What I mean by the political will here <laughs> is find out that when it comes yeah. to climate change related issues like climate actions, yeah. obviously, uh, Ministry of Environment. Yeah. is the custodian. Yeah. So as a result, uh, obviously, if there is no support coming from the ministry, yeah. obviously things will not work. Yeah. But uh, the political will simply means we must be in charge of our domestic, domestic decisions. decisions. Okay. And when I say political, it has to be everyone. Yeah. 
Okay. The, but ministry has to play a crucial role and all the stakeholders must support. Yeah. Uh, so in a sense, we're saying that uh, renewable energy, you know, uh, can help sustain, you know, um, agriculture in this country. Uh, quite well, yeah. because currently, if you look at, the, uh, for instance, there are quite a number of renewable energies. But if you look at uh, what we are endowed yeah. with as a country, for instance, sunlight, mm -hmm. we are not. I mean, I mean, utilizing the potentials of sunlight in this country. Yeah. So, as I mentioned, these case studies, we find out that the, uh, the solar rad radiance in this country can be able to give us required energy that our, our farmers need in terms of water supply, but not only water, even in terms of refrigeration, for instance, cold stores. Now, quite a number of avest goes lost uh, as a result of people cannot have a, a cold storage system so we could utilize you don't need to rely on per se now or the okay. grid system to be able to have a cold stores with a, a small projects that you use solar energy uh, you will be able to create those those system and it could improve livelihood of our their farmers okay okay now um let's um shift to the gambia college doctor yes you know um during your tenure as acting head you know of the school of agriculture at gambia college what were the key initiatives that you have implemented at the college okay you know? uh Yes, I was at Gambia College as a head of agriculture, mm -hmm. briefly, but uh, that was also very impactful. Yeah. And uh, during my time, what we did was uh, we tried to promote the culture of research, though it has been there. Okay. But what we started with, I think I started it at the Gambia College, is for students to come and, and defend their project oh, okay. so that uh, lecturers can give feedback and we can take it to the next level. And okay. that started well, and I'm happy that is still uh, in progress. Okay. And during my time also, I found out that uh, we could do better because looking at the number of students, I started a, a kind of a banana plantation. Wow. But it's, the sad thing is I found out that banana plantation is no longer no going. Longer going but okay. they were able to sustain it up to, let's say, five to seven years after my departure, and it generated a lot of income. Sure. That project I started it at uh, at the Gambia College and it 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 effect a lot of income for them. Okay. And uh, we also talk about monthly seminars that I started to invite uh, some CISIN scholars to come and talk to students to inspire them. Okay. So all those are things that I have started at the Gambia College. I don't know whether that is still ongoing. Okay. But the project defense uh, is going. I'm happy that they were able to sustain that. But unfortunately, <laughs> the banana plantation <laughs> 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 is <laughs> Yeah, but uh, what are the, some of the leadership skills um, do you think are essential uh, in managing educational institutions? Well, I think this is a very important question. Yeah. Yeah. Most often, uh, leadership is not about only having a position of power. It goes beyond that. Uh, leadership is, by, is just to code and also help others to inspire others. Inspire others okay. And you have to be very consultative as a leader. Uh, you cannot know it all. Uh, even your junior staff, you need to listen to them. They might have some brilliant ideas and try to engage and give juice to everybody and give that respect, a lot more respect. Yeah. And don't take decisions unilaterally like that. I know sometimes difficult moments come. You have to take decisions, but taking decisions goes with responsibility. Okay. You take decisions and you have to take responsibility. The responsibility so, yeah. actions, but okay. you have to be very consultative and you be very engaging. Yeah. And most often people lack that and as a result it, it becomes a problem because people think that you are the leader, you are the boss. So it shouldn't be that way. Yeah, mm -hmm. You're supposed to be able to Yeah, I know, but you know, sometimes uh, looking at the attitude of students, mm -hmm. you know, you tend to go the extra mile. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. For with the students, working with the students, I have to say that I know some of my students are working that because yeah. they, hey, sometimes you have to be also very strict. Yeah. Uh, students nowadays, what we've seen, students want easy ride. Yeah. Uh, easy ride, I mean, they want the easy way to do things. And sometimes they will not realize it when you are engaging with them. 
Sometimes I tell my students, you have to do this, you have to do it. So I have to be very strict sometimes. And later on, they, at that point in time, they would not see it. But later on, when they pass through that stage, they find the, the essence in, in that. Sometimes I do those things deliberately yeah. to also tell them that in life you need to be patient, you need to have passion, but most importantly, you must be determined to do to accomplish a task. And uh, so if you are a leader, for instance, if you are a student leader or you are a leader that is handling students, you have to work towards timeline. Timelines are very important. Uh, for instance, my doctoral research programs, I give them a, a, a roadmap and we make sure that we follow the roadmap. So yeah. if you are too flexible, uh, you will not achieve your desired results. Mm -hmm. And that's sometimes that's academic work. They say they are very rigid. It's not about rigid. It's about training. Mm -hmm. It's about training. Yeah. Looking looking at uh, previously, can can you compare your days? Mm -hmm. You know uh, when you were a student. Yes. And looking at you now, you're a teacher. Yeah. Looking at um, students now now it is. How do you compare it? Uh, in those in my time uh, at the both college at the university at the college, it was I would say it's about eighteen years ago. Uh, most of the things we do hard way, you understand what I mean by hard way. I remember when I was to even write my student project, you know, there is what we call a discard, a discard when, you, discard, yeah. when you type something and now yeah. students have a pen drive. So, yeah, discard, yeah. yeah, you know, the discard is yeah. a this. So you do things hard way and barely we use laptops. So yeah. we have a central, let's say, a computer lab where everyone goes, you type yeah. it, you save it on your desktop, you bring your disk head and you insert, insert it, it there. Insert it there. Yes, yes. And sometimes when it gets cracked and you have a problem, <laughs> but you have to write everything with your hand. Yeah. I remember I had to write my entire project at Gambia Kulai with my hand. And mm -hmm. later I tried to type it. I mean, I gave it to a secretary to help me type it. But nowadays things change. Mm -hmm. We become, students are enjoying, it becomes more of a digital uh, wow. world wow. where, of course, everybody has a a phone or a computer to do yeah. those things. Yeah. But again, it's it's making people were working hard in those days and they were seeing the result. Now the technology improves and it makes a lot of students lazy. lazy. And yeah. uh, you find out even if you give student assignment, sometimes they go online and just get everything and get it done. Yeah, exactly. So that is it. So it's, in other words, it's trying to dilute uh, a uh, uh, lot of quality mm -hmm. and which is hard to say but this is a reality but some students that are very smart are making advantage of it uh, if you have uh, if you are li if you live in a digital world mm -hmm. if you are a smart student it should make you more smarter more smart, yeah. and you'll be able to see and result but unfortunately the majority of the students nowadays is making them lazy and as a result when you are out of the a course, then you don't remember anything. You don't remember anything. Yeah, Learn and you forget. Think, yeah. Okay. Uh, right. Now, um, what um, are your future research goals? You know, and what new areas you know um, do you want to explore in agriculture and climate change economics in this country? Well, uh, just today we were discussing at the vice chancellor's office. Uh, we discussing how do we turn our sludge, this waste sludge into uh, organic fertilizer. Okay. Actually, it's a company that is in the Gambia that is working on that. So we are interested to look at the cost benefit of that thing because uh, there are quite a number of uh, things that can be turned into organic manure, for instance, in this country that can help farmers. Yeah. And uh, Looking at it, one of them could be the municipal sludge. The other one, we can have solid waste uh, stuff, we can have cow dump and the like. So, but we need to understand the economics involved in the, in those things uh, because we must also be careful in terms of sustainability. How do we sustain that kind? Whether we have the required quantity, the economics of scales of it. These are very critical. So that's one of my area. That is a cost benefit analysis of either projects or some initiatives. We can look into that. Okay. But I'm more interested right now for reclam project, okay. the Nexus. 
which I said between renewable energy, how can that impact on agriculture without compromising the land use changes in this country. Okay. So in that research, we want to see how can that project help us to have a land policy in this country that we will maximize the potentials of renewable energy in this country. I know by the end of the project, we will come with a policy paper. Uh, I know that can help this country greatly on uh, land use management policy. Okay. So uh, that's what we are working on. Yeah. Now, um, reflecting on your career, um, what uh, personal qualities and skills have are the most instrumental in your success? Because you have a successful career, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, one, I will say passion. Okay. Uh, whatever I'm doing, I have passion. If I don't have a passion for it, forget it. It's not a go area for me. If I say that I will do this, obviously I love to do it. And yeah. I will be determined to do it. Yeah. Without a passion, then you cannot go far. So if I want to get my qualities, uh, I love what I'm doing. Okay. If I don't love anything doing, I, 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 I better quit at the right time. Then I focus on something. Because normally people will, I mean, point fingers on us as in economics. They, they calculate everything. But it's not that. So if I know that I am better off in this area and have a comparative advantage, I better pursue that than taking a lot of time to do certain things that will not yield anything for me. So I develop passion for whatever I'm doing and I work to get it. That is determination. Okay. Yeah, but, but sometimes people will say, okay, we have uh, doctors like you, yes. you know, in the, in the agricultural field. Mm -hmm. uh, why are we still now struggling? Yes. Yeah. yeah. This, is a, this, is a, this yeah. is a major problem. Uh, well, Sometimes we can take responsibilities, but uh, not in all time. Because especially in this part of the world, that's where you and I, uh, you cannot do it all. Yeah. So what I believe, every individual must have a role to play. Yeah. Uh, in, in your doing your role, obviously you can help to inspire others alongside. But... Uh, we can see that in this country, if you look at people who say, but we have highest number of doctoral holders in agriculture, but why still agriculture yeah. is still? Well, it's a big problem. What is the answer? I don't know the answer at the moment, but uh, what I will believe is the mindset. If, for instance, if you are a PhD in agronomist and or you are a PhD in plant nutrition and whatever, and you are only keen in administration, it becomes a problem. What I have learned in Malaysia, coming back to Malaysia, uh, like my professor, yeah. uh, he will be in the field and he will be doing it, doing and it will be seen. So that's the thing we can, I will love all of us to go back to the field and we'll be there practically to inspire others and get things done. But if we all want to sit in the offices and um, uh, do it things only on paper, things will not work. Uh, for instance, if you want to know whether this uh, a, a PhD guy in, in, in agronomy or in agriculture, first of all, we have to start. Charity begins at home. Uh -huh. What are you doing in our individual efforts? This is very important. Uh, individual, are you able to raise your crops at your house or at your own backyard? It has to start from there. And this is not only those that are doing agriculture. It's you and I. We need to do something else. So with that, we can change and we can inspire in a, in a sense that we all need to be a, a gender of change uh, to take agriculture to this level. Yeah, yeah. but are you, are you people also considering the side of the farmers, let's say, for example, mm -hmm. you know, uh, taking farmers from the Gambia, mm -hmm. you know, taking them to Malaysia, to other countries, you mm -hmm. know, to go and study, mm -hmm. you know, um, farming there and then come back, practice it in their own country. Because people have been saying, why not, you know, you people shift now instead of, you know, taking mm -hmm. people who work in the offices, mm -hmm. you know, deal directly with the farmers themselves. I think those in some of those initiatives are going on because yeah. I 
because I was also involved in training many farmers in this country, land mm -hmm. and bread of this country, uh, through NACOFAC, you know NACOFAC? Yeah. yeah. So we train women farmers on the farmer field schools okay. and uh, where you do some kind of demonstrations. How do you do these modern farming techniques, most importantly climate smart agriculture? So some farmers along the way we are taking, but you know, number of farmers in this country. If you cannot take everybody outside of this country to go and learn learning techniques. That's no. why we have some, we have National Agricultural Research Institute, Department of Agriculture University and so on and so forth. They can help farmers to impart knowledge, uh, modern skills in farmers without taking them outside of this country. We are in a digital world now where farmers can get requisite knowledge without going outside of the borders of this country. So what we need to do, we can do better by doing more engagements, but the most important is those who have the know-how. Let them not sit in the offices, let them go out and do the impact. Okay. So that is more important. But if you want to take everybody, where will you get the budget to take every farmer outside of this country? Okay. I mean, we can have trials here, a farmer field schools. In a field school, you train 10, 30 farmers, and those 30 farmers, each of them will turn around, we can have a multiplier effect. Okay. So many farmers can get the required knowledge. All right, All right. so about to conclude, mm -hmm. um, how do you balance your your life, mm -hmm. all right? Um, your personal life and working life, how, how do you balance it? What are the activities that you do to keep yourself, you know, mm -hmm. going? Because you seem to be a very busy man. Yeah, I, if I would yeah. say this is uh, currently one of my weakness, you know, yes. because sometimes uh, I keep working. If I have a tax to complete, I, have, I need to tax, uh, complete it. So it becomes my biggest weakness. Maybe you can help me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's my problem at the yeah. moment, though I try by all means to have more time with the family on Sundays, and uh, but I work round the clock. That's from Monday to Saturday, and sometimes my students complain I'm very difficult to see. Uh, this is quite true. Of late, I become too engaging, and uh, all this just to be impactful. But I think at some point in time, I have to retire on time. <laughs> and I balance my personal life most yeah. greatly. This is very important because it's important for my health too. Uh, it's, but it's my weakness, as I, to be honest with you, at the moment. Mm, okay. Yeah, it's work, work. Some are saying I'm a worker, work, workaholic. workaholic. Uh, but it's, 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 it's just a passion for work. All right. Yes. Then we are blessed then to have you. Huh? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a pleasure. <laughs> okay. Uh, finally, um, what advice do you have, you know, for aspiring professionals, you know, researchers, you know, and students in, in the field that you're doing? Yes. Uh, my biggest advice for anybody who wants to pass, uh, aspire to become uh, either a leader or to become academic. Number one, discipline, self-discipline is, is very critical, you know, and it has to go with patience, you know. Uh, if you are not disciplined, uh, it becomes a problem to get to where you are. You know, sometimes people tend to be very confrontational at the work or at where, so you don't need to be confrontational. I mean, take your time and I mean, communicate well. If you don't communicate well, it becomes a problem. And that communication is itself a self-discipline. And let's have passion for whatever we are doing and be determined to move forward. And we can do it together. Yep. So if we all put our hands on deck, and we'll be able to be there one day. But the most importantly, mindset, I would say, Let's work on our mindset. Uh, change is possible, no. but if you become part of it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sawane, uh, for talking to Talk Me on GM EB TV. It's a pleasure always. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, viewers, um, thank you very much. Uh, that was the interview that we have with um, Dr. Sawane right here on GM EB TV. I'm your host, um, Sarah Kamara. Say goodbye to all of you out there. We'll be back. That's going to be next week, inshallah, live from us.